All right, you guys ready? Go for it, go. Good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's stand and sing together and we'll worship the Lord for everything he's done for us as we're praising him on this Easter morning. thankful that he's alive today. Aren't you so thankful for the cross? We're thankful to be standing here today celebrating a risen Lord who came and died and bled for our sins. And he's risen today. He's alive today so that we can face tomorrow with confidence and knowing that whatever comes our way, he's already conquered it. Together. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance. 
thank you for uh, what you've done for us, Lord, for, for coming to this world and living the life that we live and uh, seeing the world through our eyes, Lord, so that you can know us better and so that we can look to you as our example. Lord, you died for our sins. You rose again in victory so that we can do so with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Sorry, I forgot my notes. Sorry. Hey, good morning. Have a seat. All right. We are, well, okay, you just sat down. Here's what we need. Uh, we need more space. So for those of you who sat down, stand up and squeeze towards the middle. So in here, squeeze toward the middle. And let's do this. If you're on the side, squeeze toward the outside. Or yeah, just make space. Just make space. Make space so people can sit down. My name is Fred. I get to be the lead pastor here. And happy Easter. He is risen. Oh, y'all are so good. That's great. Um, uh, if this is your first Easter in church, let me tell you what just happened. Um, on Easter, particularly, is a Sunday where we say, the person up here says, he is risen. And then the congregation responds. And Easter is really the only day we do that. Although it's true, all year, long, all year long, for some reason, Easter's the day we do that. So if you missed out, just catch us again next year, and we'll do it, we'll do it again, all right? Uh, my name is, like I said, my name is Fred. Uh, if you are new here, um, we would love to connect with you, and there are a couple of ways to do that. 
Uh, if you're here in person, uh, there is a QR code in front of you, and you can scan that on your phone. It'll take you to our website, and you can fill out a Connect card there. And that's how you can let us know. If you're watching online, you can just go to fellowshipashville.com slash connect and let us know that you are with us uh, today. And also what's good, there is also a place for prayer request when you do that. And so if you would like us to join you in prayer for something, we would be delighted to do that. And so that's a way you can scan that QR code, let us know your prayer request, and we would love to do that. And if you're interested in finding out more about Fellowship Asheville, let me tell you about the next step in that. The next step is called Discovery. And it is a Discovery Lunch. The next one will be Sunday, April 21st. And that is a 30,000-foot view of the church. We'll have lunch together, talk about our mission, vision, values, kind of who we are as a church, give you an opportunity to get to know some of the staff, uh, ask some questions, and just to get to know us, and we get to know you, and it is a great time, and it's right after church. Child care is available, uh, so, so let us know that you would like to do that, and you can do that by registering on our website. And then just one more announcement for us on Easter is, is an opportunity to connect on April uh, 14th, we are doing a picnic and pickleball. Oh, are y'all pickleball fans? Okay, a few of you are. Are you picnic fans? Okay, so, so uh, we're going to be at Murphy Oakley Park, which is just caddy corner from here. Um, bring your own lunch. Uh, bring yard games if you want, if you don't want to play pickleball. But can we talk about pickleball for just a second? How many of you have never played pickleball before? Okay, there's a lot of young hands that went up in the air. Okay, let's imagine, let's imagine the age spectrum is a pool of water, all right? And on one side of the pool are people who would identify as young on that age spectrum. On the other side of the pool are people who are on the older side of life in that pool, all right? Pickleball typically is played oftentimes by the people on the older side of the pool, now, I myself have played pickleball a few times. I would put myself somewhere in the middle of that pool, right? I know I'm swimming towards the older side of the pool, but there's parts of me that feels like still younger side of the pool. When you play pickleball, if, if, if you have this youthful naivete about you when it comes to pickleball, let me tell you what happens. People show up that are on the, other, the older side of the pool, right? They get out of their car and they moan because they, ugh. They get out of the car and they stretch, right? Just getting out of the car. They haven't even stretched to play pickleball yet. They're stretching. And if you have this youthful part of you, you think, oh, this is going to be easy. And then they put knee braces on and elbow braces on and wrist braces on. Let me tell you what those braces are. Now, I've learned this. This is so such helpful advice. Those knee braces and elbow braces, every brace shows you what level of black belt they are <laughs> in pickleball. Because they will mop the court with your youthful optimism. And I don't know how it happens. And, like, for every point they get and you don't, they will bless your heart. So it'll be real fun. Join us. Pickleball. Uh, all levels are welcome. Um, it is a first-come, first-serve pickleball courts over there. And so we will be kind to our neighbors and not take up the, all the courts the whole time. Uh, but if nobody from the neighborhood is there, we will play all levels. So, so join us. Bring your lunch. Uh, bring um, a, another yard game if you want, if you're not into pickleball. And it'll be great fun. And again, that is Sunday, April 14th. If, and register on our website just so we know uh, who else coming. All right. Matt's going to come up. For the Easter sermon today, I'm very excited. Um, so, Thanks. here we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Happy Sunday. Any uh, anybody on the young spectrum get fired up with their competitive nature when Fred was just talking about that? <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> no, no, you did, Donald. I could feel it exuding from you. Hey, happy happy Easter Sunday, everybody. Great to see you. If you, if you have your Bible or a phone or a tablet or whatever you want to follow along in, in scriptures, we're going to be in the book of Romans today in chapter 6. And so if you want to find that, um, today is, is Resurrection Sunday. And so we are joining in 
and, and for the last 1,991 years, what followers have been doing on Easter Sunday, which is celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. You know, thinking about it in terms of those years for me has been helpful because it reminds us we're part of a, a global, historic, like religion and faith in someone named Jesus of Nazareth who, who lived the life that we believe he, he lived, that did the things we believe he did according to the stories we have in Scripture, that, that died on the cross at the hand of the Romans, betrayed by his own people, and then three days later rose from the grave. And so because of that, that's why we're here today. That's why we say he is risen. He's risen indeed. And so, so today what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about and answer the question, why is the resurrection of Jesus a big deal? Why is it a big deal? And so if you came and you were kind of, maybe you, you've been to church on Easter and you've heard a sermon about like trying to prove to you or convince you that the resurrection of Jesus actually did happen, I'm not going to do that today. If you want a, a better treatment of it than I could ever give standing up here for for uh, a sermon on Sunday morning, you can read a book by a man, a uh, scholar, historical theologian named N.T. Wright. It's called The Resurrection of the Son of God. It's a, it's a big book, but it is kind of like the masterpiece on that. Uh, or maybe you grew up going to church or, or you've heard about the good news of Jesus or the gospel of Jesus. And it's only ever in terms of like the cross and what happened with Jesus in his death. Right? And, 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 and maybe you've heard the gospel kind of kind of put down in, in, into a little kind of bite-sized uh, sentence of Jesus in my place or something like Jesus died for my sins so that I can be with him forever in heaven. And, and, and those things are not untrue, but they're just a piece of the pie. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that much today, the cross. That was Good Friday. Uh, but if you want another good treaty on that, something that I won't be able to do in a sermon, if you want the shorter version, Leon Morris wrote a book called The Glory in the Cross. I'd encourage you to read that. Or if you want to go on a like theological marathon, you can read John Stott's 350 plus page, The Cross of Christ. They'll do that. But, but, but what I, what I want to talk about today, like I said, is why is the resurrection important? Here we are on Easter Sunday. We put on our nicest shirts, Right? which is subjective because I don't like collared shirts. So to me, this is not my nicest shirt, but I was told to wear it. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, Paul defines the gospel of Jesus. And he said, Here, here's the gospel that I received and I passed on to you, which is of first importance, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve and then to more and more people from there. And so, while dying for our sins is important, we remember that on Good Friday. Today we talk about the resurrection because the resurrection is the exclamation mark of the gospel. The resurrection of Jesus is what proves, finalizes, and declares that the life and death of Jesus accomplished everything that he said it would. And not just him, but the thousands of years of prophecy and scripture before Jesus came. So we're going to look at Romans 6. We're going to see what, what happens to us when, when we are confronted with the truth, the good news, the gospel of Jesus. What happens to us as we place our faith in Jesus in the resurrection? And so as we kind of get going today, I, it, it was interesting. Uh, anybody been watching the NCAA tournament this year? There's a, there's a commercial that keeps popping up that grabbed my attention. It's from Bank of America. And at the end of the commercial, there's a picture that comes up. And it looks like this in the bottom right. There we go. What would you like the power to do? Now, that is a tantalizing question, isn't it? What would you like the power to do? What is it that you would like if you could snap your fingers or wave a magic wand? see happen or changed in your life, right? For Bank of America, of course, they're trying to get us to buy into the idea that money is power, right? Money is power to change our lives. Money is power to have influence. Money is power to, ha to have comfort and happiness and the things that we want in life. But for us who have gathered in a church building, I would hope that if we ask, what would you like the power to do in light of the resurrection of Jesus, maybe there's something that you would want to change in your life. 
Maybe there's something about, maybe there's something that you wish you had the power to change a life circumstance. Maybe you sit there today and you're like, I just want to be a person marked by the presence of God. I want to be a person of love. I want to experience peace in my life that goes above the abilities to fix myself. And that's what Paul is getting at as he reflects on the life that we now have possible because of the resurrection of Jesus. So if you're here today and you would love the power to change, if you want a life marked by the life of Jesus, then welcome to church. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 6. So Paul at this point in his letter to the Roman church, the Roman church had experienced a lot of change. Uh, so, so when the gospel of Jesus, first the message of Jesus kind of made its way through the Roman Empire out of Jerusalem, uh, it made its way to Rome, and there was a, a community of, of Jesus followers who started gathering together uh, trying to figure out what it means. And so Rome, of course, was a very multi-ethnic, multi-cultural, multi-socioeconomic place. And all of those who had met Jesus and came together started experiencing, how do we live life like this? That's what the community of Jesus has looked like all over the globe since its conception at Pentecost. They were crossing lines that normally wouldn't get crossed. But then the emperor uh, made a decree about 10 or 20 years after the gospel of Jesus came. And he said that all, the, all Jews had to leave Rome. All right, so they kicked all of the Jews out. So that includes Jews who, who had placed their faith in Jesus and had now become followers of Jesus. They left, and then after about a decade or so, they came back into Jerusalem. They were welcomed back in. And, and so now this church was kind of trying to figure out, how do, we, how do we follow Jesus together now? Because if something's not right in front of you all the time, right, out of sight, out of mind. And so without being mindful of each other's kind of cultural differences, religious backgrounds, socioeconomic situations, uh, the Roman church has been dealing with, with how do we do this? So they write to Paul. Paul writes back to them and we get this letter. And so Paul spends the first few chapters kind of explaining to them that it doesn't matter who you are, that anyone who has placed their faith in Jesus receives right standing with God or, or, or they are justified in God's sight. They have received justification. And so apparently in the letter that he received from Rome, uh, from the Roman church, uh, they, they kind of make the statement like, well, if grace is what we experience in our sin, then let's just keep on like sinning, so we keep getting more grace. Like we've trained pigeons and mice to do this, right? Like press this button and you get treats that come out of a trap door, right? Humans aren't that different, okay, in that sense. Like we like to receive good things, yes? Who's an adult here and you woke up and still wish you got an Easter basket? <laughs> At least the treats in the Easter basket. Who here wrote ate a Reese's egg this morning? Anyone? Church, come on, let's be honest. Does anybody else put them in the freezer? Anybody? That'll change your ministry. <laughs> I'm telling, golly. Anyway, okay, sorry. Uh, goes on, okay, so, so, he's, so he's telling this church, hey, it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what your background is. If you have met Jesus, you have be, been made a new person. And so he, he's kind of answering that question. As he picks it up in chapter 5, and then it kind of goes on like, like, should we keep on sinning so that we receive more grace? So that we, and he says, of course not, right? That's what he says. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Or of course not. We are those who have died to sin. So how can we live in it any longer? Like, think about the effects of sin in your life. All right, so sin, just generally we can say sin is anything that goes against God's will for human flourishing, okay? That goes against God's design for humans to experience life as he created it. All right, think about maybe not even your own sin, but maybe someone has sinned and it has affected you greatly, right? And now think about the possibility of being dead to sin, like being totally free from sin. He says, how can we, who have died to sin, live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, 
we too might have a new life. Think about that. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, meaning like a glorious display of God's power and lordship over death, we too may live a new life. Man, is there anyone, you can raise your hands, you can say amen, we're allowed to do that. Can anyone here testify that when you met Jesus, you received new life? Is there anyone in the room that can look back and see, not just at the moment you met Jesus, but as you've walked with Jesus, you have seen how you have changed to be more like him, to desire the things that he wants, that you can say, I used to be blank, man, but now because of Jesus, I'm this. Man, this is good news. This is the good news for us. Because just as Jesus was raised from the dead to the glory of, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. See, later on in, in this letter, Paul writes in chapter 8, he says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of or through his spirit who lives in you. So that means that if we're talking about new life, you may say, what does new life look like? Like, like what does new life look like that is possible? It means that the same spirit, God's spirit himself, he gave to us so that we can then live in the life that he gives us. What it means is that we live a life that's based on the blueprint of Jesus himself. Jesus is the blueprint of new life. So here, here's why this is a big deal. Here's why we're talking about the resurrection and the big deal. See, the, the world, any, anyone can handle the idea that a man who claimed to die so that anyone who follows him is free from their sin, we can handle that. Especially now in our culture, we, we generally just kind of assume that we are not accountable to any kind of higher power other than ourselves. It's like, big deal, you can believe whatever you want. But what's hard to come to terms with is when someone comes in contact with Jesus and they become a new thing, they become a new person, and they change, that they are made new, not just different, but new. That's what we receive when we, through the resurrection of Jesus, when we place our faith in him and commit ourselves to follow, to obey, to disciple under. The word disciple could maybe be easier translated for us, apprentice under Jesus. We are fundamentally changed and become people of resurrection. In the, in the same way that Jesus rose from the dead, so we may live a new life. And, and so, let's just clarify that, that new life doesn't necessarily mean better, right? Well, yes, yes and no. A new life can mean a better life. It doesn't mean a better sense in the way Bank of America defines it in the commercial Right? Placing your faith in Jesus does not promise any kind of like expansion of your wealth or your power or your influence or that you'll be guaranteed that your family's going to look this way or that you'll even have a family in that way or, or that you'll finally have romance that'll like fulfill you or that you'll have ease and comfort in life or health as far as life on earth is concerned. But the new life Jesus offered is a massive Yes, a resounding yes through the years of, of 1,991 years of church history that we get a life of rest and of peace and of healing and hope and belonging. And we're given a new family. We're given a new identity all in the name of Jesus because we now have his life in us. But Tim Keller puts it like this, and I, I love it. He says, it often takes this experience of crippling weakness for us to finally discover this life of Jesus. That is why so many of the most God-blessed people limp as they dance for joy. And so if that's something that you would like to experience, welcome to church. Happy Easter Sunday. And that's why this is kind of, in a way, the first week of what we're going through, a sermon series through the rest of the year, a sermon series called Rooted, talking about our identity. So our identity as people of Jesus starts with the resurrection. 
that given the DNA of Jesus, the same spirit that raised him through the dead now lives in us because of his life, sacrificial death on the cross, and his resurrection. It's available for us to live in his power and his presence and his provision. So I, what I want to do is I want to talk about what, does it look, what, are, what are some aspects of this new life, right? We, we've thrown out words like sin and death already. Like, what does that look like? And then we're going to answer the question, so how does this actually work, right? Pie-in-the-sky theoretical ideas are great, but the reality is we still have to live on this earth, right? So let's talk about some aspects of, of, of the new life in Jesus. Look at verses 5 through 11. He says, For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin by all of the things that go against God's design for us to live the life he designed us to live might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So these aspects of, of what it means to have new life, it means free from sin and death. So let's talk about that again. Like I said, Paul has been going through this letter kind of in this like cycling, like almost tornado, building to the climax of his letter in Romans chapter 8. Where, where he's talking about how sin and death are entangled in the human condition. Right? We die because of sin. And, and there is sin because we are dead people walking around. And that sounds really harsh, but that's the brutal cycle that began in the Garden of Eden. But, but look at the, the flow of logic here. All right? he, he, he basically says that the resurrection is both a present and a future reality. From verses 9 and 10, we see the example that Jesus set. It says that, For we know that since he was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has any mastery over him. We've been trying to accomplish this since the Enlightenment. We have, we have bought into the idea that if humans create and do and make enough stuff, that we will be able to live better lives without the help of anything else, especially any kind of higher power. But rates of anxiety, Suicide, hospitalizations, wars have just continued to go up through the years as that mindset has prevailed. But what it means that when Jesus died, it means he no longer is bound by the plague that haunts that human condition, which is sin. And since he died and he rose from the dead, he's conquered death, which was the penalty for our sin. So, so here's what I mean when I'm talking about sin, penalty for sin, God's creation. See, God created the world and he looked at it and he said, it was good. And he created humans, and he said, humans are very good. See, the baseline of God's plan for human existence is a good, ordered world on his terms. But then there was a foreign agent that entered into his creation. Think about it like the body contracting a virus. There was a foreign agent that entered into God's good creation, which was living life not according to his plan or his design, that we now called sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, it entered the world. And humans, we've been making a mess of God's good creation since we've walked on the earth. Right? I mean, I mean, we have really made a mess of the good things that God has given us to steward. And so what's the payment for that sin? Right? Just as sin was a foreign agent into the world, death also was not a part of God's plans for humans. But as sin entered... The, the payment, the penalty, if you speed up the process of sin, it leads to death because that's the only way it could get out of a world that God created to have life with him forever. And so sin is the foreign agent, and now our condition called mortality is a slave to it because no matter how many green drinks we drink, right, no matter how many different diets we try, What's the death rate of humans? 100%. Right? You know, we're here this morning because it just hasn't got us yet. It's tried, right? 
It's tried, but it, hasn't, it just hasn't gotten us yet. But when Jesus died, as a fully human, he died to sin. And someone who's dead can't do anything wrong anymore, can they? Like they can't. Think about the logic. Like, like it's easy to, to like read into this and overemphasize all the theological nuance. But the reality is Paul's logic here is he died, so it's impossible for him to sin. He can't, he can't do it. He's no longer under the, the, the temptation and the struggles against corruption in every sense of the world on this earth, in this human existence. And so just as we believe that about Jesus, it says in verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. See, what, what happens when we believe this about Jesus, we place our faith and say, Jesus, I want this life that you offer. We receive forgiveness and freedom. Forgiveness from sins that we've ever committed in this life. And while we, not, we may not be totally free from sin, what it does is God gives us his spirit. Paul talks about it in a, in a different letter. He says we have this treasure, which is this God's spirit living in us, but these jars of clay, right? Some of us feel the jars of clay a little bit heavier when we're putting on our knee braces and elbow braces to play pickleball. But we have God's, this treasure, God's own spirit living in us, renewing us day by day. See, when we believe in Jesus, we die to our old selves and we're given his Holy Spirit, which is the baptism into his life. See, and then, so, so the, the question is, it's like, okay, that's great. We're talking about sin and death. The good news, Jesus died, so do we. But Jesus didn't stay dead and neither do we. Remember verses 8 and 10. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with him because he didn't stay dead and we've been given his life. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. See, Jesus, his death paid the price for sin. But in his life, he became the human. In his resurrected life, he became the human that no longer has to answer to the power of death. Like we sing in the song, Oh, death, where is your sting? In his new life, his new resurrected life, he proved that he only has to answer to God now. There's no more of that tug back away from the things that God and the way that he made us to live. He made sin a non-issue. And then not only did he defeat death, but he also made it possible for there to be life to God. Life to God. That there's life with God. There's life for God, but Jesus shows us a life to God where all that he does, all that he says, all that he is, is given to God. And in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. In the, in the same way, all of the things that Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection, the implications of life now and forevermore, we get those in the same way that Jesus did. In the same way. So once again, think about the way sin has affected your life. Whether decisions and actions you yourself have done or that other people have done that have, that have seriously affected your life. Broken relationships, addictions, the trauma that you can remember from those years ago. Jesus in his death to sin, in his resurrection to life with God, the, the, the little book we read with our toddler, the Jesus Storybook Bible, says all wrongs made right because of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And we still feel the reality of sin in the world, in the life we live now. But the venom from the bite of the snake that still runs in our earthly veins is replaced with the blood of Jesus so that we have hope for the future, even here on earth. See, in the same way that Jesus was resurrected, came back to earth, the damage control we now have is incredible. Because you say, I, I want to change, but Matt, I just can't shake this. I can't give this up. I can't forgive that person. Let me just remind you of that verse from Romans 8. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. It's like the old hymn says, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. The resurrection of Jesus not only offers spiritual freedom from sin and from death at this big theoretical level, but it literally allows us to live a new life like Je- the way like, that looks like the life of Jesus. Colossians says that all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form in Jesus. And it says, in Christ Jesus, we have been brought to that fullness. Like, think about that in your life. Think, think about, once again, I started with, 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 have you ever thought yourself as forgiven and free? Like, the reality of what we're talking about today means that you no longer have to live in condemnation or shame or fear. Right? Because here's what happens. Here, here's what can happen oftentimes, I think. Is, is we hear sermons like this. Maybe you read a good devotional in the morning. You know, you listen to something good on the radio on the way to work or school or whatever. And you think, okay, today's the day where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live like Jesus. Okay? And then what happens within the next 30 minutes-ish? We don't live like Jesus. Okay? So here's what happens. What happens is... We're given a choice in that moment to judge our ability to live the new life given to us on Jesus. We're going to judge that life and we're going to say, well, I can't actually live that life. And what we do is we we think of the possibilities of new life based on our own efforts and abilities. But what we see in the resurrection of Jesus and what Paul is telling us is that when we think of new life, the possibility of that new life isn't based on our abilities, but it's based on what Jesus made possible. See, I think one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is not to get us to make some huge, massive, life-altering decision that's going to like ruin our lives forever, but he's just going to get you to think that your life in Jesus is only possible in your effort and ability and the things you've been able to do in the past so that you slowly slip into into a lack of confidence in your walk so that you just become complacent and lukewarm. But we are given that life of Jesus. It's possible for us to live to God the same way that Jesus does. I like the way there's a guy, Thomas Smell, he's a, he's a Scottish theologian from the mid-1900s, and, and he put it like this in his book, Reflective Glory. He said, if we wish to measure the possibilities of our humanity, we are not to look at ourselves and scale Christ down to us or worship the goodness and the greatness of a divinity that is, in principle, inaccessible to us. But we are to look to him and to behold the human that is Jesus, and therefore the human that we shall be in him. So, like I said, the resurrection of Jesus means that we now have a resurrection with this body right now. Not just in it, but with it. And yeah, this physical body's failing. We understand that. We understand the reality of our human nature. But we also put in the sense, the real sense, that we are being renewed day by day as we live a life to God. And so, so it's like, okay, how does this actually work? If you are still alive, okay, and you believe in Jesus, you get to live a resurrected life. You get to live a life that looks like the life of Jesus. What we have experienced personally is a taste, right? When we come to Jesus and we're given his new life, we become like an outpost in the war zone. It's like we get to be a small twinkle in a black sky of what Jesus plans to do with all of creation. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. So it's every time you choose an act to love other people. Every time we die to self and temptation or to take advantage of somebody else for our own personal gain. Every time there's healing in a family. Every time a hopeless child is offered life in a family of love. Every time we take a stand against systems of oppression in any other form, when we choose any other form of righteousness, given to us by the blueprint of Jesus, and we say no to the old self ruled by sin, then you can say, this is me living 
in my new life. This is what I'm doing. I mean, essentially, that's what it means to be a witness. As the apostles received the Holy Spirit and started doing the works and, the, and, exp, and showing the life of Jesus and their bodies around, people witnessed the reality of Jesus in them. Right? When we choose to trust that God hears our prayers, every time that we fast so that we can feast on the life of Jesus in the Spirit, every time we learn and we see how God is working around us and we join Him in that life, every time that we, we read Scripture and we apply it in our lives to live in the will of God, we are living to God. Elizabeth Elliot put it in, in one of her Easter reflections. She said, It is in the opportunities of the everyday with real people, i.e., real sinners, that we, sinners too, are called to his companionship. Give up your rights, abandon yourself, and follow me, is what Jesus said. Follow me to the place where death cannot possibly hold you, where animosities and offenses are vanquished, and life springs victorious. And so a question, if you're here today, you're, you're a follower of Jesus, and you say, Matt, how, what, what's just a, a good kind of way I can step forward living in this new life? I would just say, kill something, bring something to life. What I mean kill something is, what is there in your life that is still being ruled by sin, by the old self? Is there anything in your life that you need to kill so that you can have the life of Jesus replace it? Man, for me, I am by nature a very undisciplined person. Like, like if it were up to me, I would have no work ethic, and I would just like lay around and eat as much food as I wanted, any kind of food I wanted. And I would just, the consequences of it, I would just bear it. Okay, I have to be a discipline. One thing that I've had to do is, is I cannot sleep with my phone in the same bedroom as me. I can't do it. Okay. Like, I have to leave my phone in a different room, and I use my, my, my watch. I don't like sleeping with a watch, but I use my watch to, to set an alarm so that when I wake up, the first thing that I don't do is look at my phone. Because next thing I know, I'm distracted, and I end up playing silly games or doing Duolingo because I can justify learning Spanish over reading my Bible and praying. So, like, I'll do that. And not that that's a bad thing. But one simple way that I have to die to myself so that I can experience Jesus is choose Scripture before screens. That's just a a simple way. Another way, one of the best ways that I've learned to do this is by fasting. Like literally 24 hours without eating. It for me, it is the it has been the sharpest way that I can say no to the appetites of my flesh and literally pray the prayer, Jesus, replace this desire and this appetite with an appetite for you. Like give me, help me to desire you more than I desire food. It's just an easy way to do it. But, but maybe there's something a little more simple. Maybe for you it's, it's the way you're handling your business. You know that you're taking advantage of people. And you need to restructure that. Maybe it's the way you even just view someone that's supposed to be a loved one in your family, but you view as an enemy. And you need to forgive them. Whatever that is, what's something that you need to kill so that you can experience the life of Jesus? Because Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. That rest for our souls is possible because of his life, his sacrificial death, and his resurrection. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Let me pray, and then we'll continue worshiping Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you made it possible for us to have new life. Jesus, we live, none of us need convincing that we live in a world that is broken. But Jesus, as we look at, at, a, at a blueprint for life of what new life looks like, that you came to heal, that you came to raise from the dead, that you came to give, that you came not to take for yourself, but you actually emptied yourself, left the throne of heaven, took on our form as a human, endured temptation, betrayal, heartache, hunger, poverty, so that you could show us that true life exists in love and in peace and in mercy. And so Jesus, as we today as a people, 1,900 years later, across continents, cultures, languages, 
look back on your life and your resurrection, Jesus, we remember that you're here with us today. You said we're two or more gathered in your name, that you are there with us. And so, Jesus, today as we finish out worshiping in prayer and in song, meet us here. For those of us who are meeting you for the first time, let them feel your grace and your love. And for those of us who maybe haven't met with you in a long time, Jesus, let us feel your rest and your restoration of our souls. And Jesus, for all of us in the room today, be with us and, and, and empower us and give us the courage to join you in living the new life that you made possible. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's respond and worship together as we celebrate what God's done for us, the life that we have in Christ.
chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. was forsaken so I will never be His grace is my salvation the gift of God the work of Calvary
Jesus, thank you that as you've triumphed over death, you've given us your life. So be with us as we leave today to walk in your life, in this new life that you've made possible. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody, thank, thanks for being here. If you, um, before we go, real quick, if, if you uh, made a spiritually significant decision today, so, so whether that's for the first time you feel like you, you met Jesus or you want to live that life with Jesus uh, and you, you know, you've heard the story, the good news of Jesus, and you believe it, maybe for the first time, like I said, now you're like, well, where do I go from here? Uh, please let us know. One of those QR codes on the seat back in front of you, you can scan that. Uh, let us know, or, or we've got some staff hanging out. You're more than welcome to come up. I'll turn my mic off. More than welcome to talk to you about that. But then also, if you're, if you're like, hey, I've, I've, been, I've believed in Jesus for a long time, but I would love to know more about how to actually like, follow him and walk in this new life, what it means to follow Jesus more, let us know that too. We, we would love to know that uh, about you, and, and we'd love to be able to walk with you in that. But uh, have a great Easter, a great rest of your week, and, and we have a little photo op. So if your family's in their best clothes today, all right, you can take balloons, a circle back there. And so everybody have a great week. See you soon.